So, okay, thanks for the opportunity and thanks, Mike. Um, uh, as you will have heard that um, Mike Barton and Paul Higgins and I are doing this, uh, are going around the country uh, wandering, uh, telling stories. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is um, really some, some sort of reflections, I suppose, some thinking about uh, from now to the future. I'm going to talk from the past to the future, really. I'm going to, my focus is going to be on sheep. Um, I'm not going to talk much about beef, um, although we can talk about beef and the questions you really want to. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what's been happening in on-farm productivity and the future, what I see as a future challenge, what we can do now to improve profitability, and then thinking about the future, some of the trends and opportunities. And I said the focus is on sheep. So what I'm going to talk, you've heard a little bit, bit, a little bit from uh, Mike and a little bit from Tom Fraser this morning about what's going on in productivity. Right, so the good news is, and this is extraordinary news, and, and Tom Fraser mentioned it this morning, is that productivity over the last 25 years has gone up by 2.5% compound per year, which is about nearly 90% in the last 25 years in terms of productivity in sheep. And that's productivity per kilogram of meat sold per adult ewe, which is absolutely extraordinary if you start thinking about it. In terms of, um, and that's in a huge increase over there. And that is in fact what's enabled us to even keep farming sheep. It's that increase in productivity. As Mike pointed out, despite that our profit per hectare is still going down. Or profit per um, uh, animal is still going down. Return on investment. And that's been due to a combination of genetics and management. So what are the components of productivity? Fundamentally there are two things. Where you make your money from and what costs your money. What makes money is lambing rate per ewe, uh, including the lambs from hoggets, the carcass weights of lambs, and then the, the bit of money from the carcass weight of ewes. What costs money is a disappearance rate of, of adult ewes, and the culling, and what you've got to cull uh, just for age, cull for age, and disappearance. And we'll talk a bit more about these in a minute, because these two things at the bottom, the cost, determine how many replacements you've got. So fundamentally, what costs you money is, um, is basically the, the sheep that go missing and get sold. That determines how much replacements. So what's been going on in productivity? And this is the thing, and up and down, okay, it goes up and down some years with droughts, and this year we back a bit. But fundamentally, you can see that productivity, kilograms of meat per adult ewe, per ewe mated, adult ewe mated, goes up, has been going up steadily for the last 25 years. And before that, it was basically more or less a flat line for the previous 15 years. So, what, look at ewe and lamb carcass weights, about 0.2 kilograms a year over that same time. Tailing percentage has gone up, so now about 100, near enough to 130% of uh, uh, lamb's tail per adult ewe mated. And part of that comes from hoggets and part from adult ewes, obviously. So, what, is it, what does it actually look like in terms of productivity? And this is an extraordinary story in its own right. Um, it's lamb's tail per ewe have gone up by about a bit over a, percent, a percentage unit per year. Carcass weight's gone up by about 0.2 kilos a year. Cull ewe weight's gone up by about, by about the same. And ewe productivity has gone up by 0.45 kilos per year, nearly 0 0.5, 0 0.4 to 0.5 kilos a year, about 2.5% per year compound rate of growth, which is extraordinary. So here it is, the co annual compound rates over the whole period, and you will have seen this 86% figure down below from uh, some of Mike, uh, Mike's talk before from, um, uh, from the beef and lamb work, and you look at those, 30%, basically a 30% increase in lamb's tail per ewe, nearly 40% in lamb carcass weight, and about a 25-30% about increase in um, ewe carcass weight and overall ewe productivity, nearly 90%. So people ask, what about the feed cost? And someone said yesterday, you should have done it on a per hectare basis. Well, I would have liked to have done that, but the fundamental problem is that um, if you look at where sheep are grazing now, it's not where sheep were grazing uh, 25 years ago. I'm involved in a, uh, with a farming company, uh, on a board of a farming company, and we are farming country now where basically one of them properties ran less than a ewe per hectare 
um, uh, 25 years ago, and the other one ran probably about three. They're now running uh, one way, way, way more than that. Three and uh, two to five times as many sheep now per hectare as they were then. In other words, they weren't being used for grazing at all, fundamentally. So these are massive differences, massive increases. So what's happened to feed cost? Well, the incre that 86% increase in, over in productivity per U has come at a cost of about 15 to 20% more feed, which is, a, to give you an idea, that's a huge increase in efficiency. What's it been due to? It's been due to two big things, really. To me, one is the ram breeding sector, the massive uh, improvement in genetic improvement, uh, and that's happened through two things, the consolidation of the ram breeding sector, the larger ram breeding flocks, and the penetration of things like sheep improvement, um, the central progeny test, and all those new technologies that have come into the ram breeding flocks. And then it's the uptake of all that on farm, the uptake of new technologies on farms, rams, people buying rams, pasture, better pasture management, and better use of cattle, actually cattle as the big hay balers, despite being on tougher country. And the other thing about better pasture management is I think the looking over the fence at dairy farmers and seeing how they, how they farm pasture is actually having an impact as well. So, there was something I was going to say there, but I've forgotten about it. That doesn't matter. It'll come back. Okay. So what have we seen? Now, that's been due to both the improvements in the last 25 years have been due to genetics and management. And uh, within Abacus, we've been doing some work with um, uh, beef and lamb, looking at what, what the genetic impact has been in, in these sort of areas. And about half the, the improvement in lamb growth and uh, lamb growth rate and carcass weight is due to genetics, and about half has been due to management. If you look at it in lambing percentage, about two-thirds of it's been due to genetics and about a third due to management. These are sort of rough rules of thumb about what's in fact, what the combination has been. So it's been a combination of better genetics and better management is what's actually driven these gains. So now we go on to the challenge. Okay, how are we going to go, how are we going to increase it by, say, 40% in the next um, ten, uh, 15 years? That's about the same compound rate of gain we're talking about now. How are we going to do that? Is it even feasible? Or, are we, or is this just a dream? Okay, how would we do it? What would it take? And this little picture here tells you what it would take. Fundamentally, it would mean that we have to go from about lamb's tail per mixed age ewe from about 130 to 150%. It sounds daunting. Lamb's tail for mixed age ewes, though, only goes up by about 7%. In other words, most of that's due to hoggets. Lamb carcass weight goes up by 4 kilos. It's quite a big lift. It's gone up by more than four, by about 5 kilos over the previous 25 years, but it's, about, it's still quite a big lift. The ewe disappearance rate, and this is a funny thing, this ewe disappearance rate. Um, if you go to the beef and lamb economic service numbers, it looks like about 5.5% of ewes die a year. However, when you go to the farm data and you work out what the difference between the number of ewes culled and the number of hoggets retained, that is closer to 10%. So there's something funny going on there. And one of, the, one of the KPIs that we use in some of the farming operations we're involved in is actually what is this disappearance rate? And the disappearance rate in, um, in sheep uh, we, we've got a target of, some of them, uh, we try to get below 6%. It's pretty hard to find farms below 6%, I have to say. In beef cattle, we've got a target of under 3, and beef, beef cows, and you tend to find it's under 3 quite often, quite often under 3. So cattle don't die nearly as much as sheep, which is a great thing. So why emphasise productivity? And we get, I get hit between the eyes quite a bit about this. Why emphasise productivity? We're not, making, not getting enough for our lambs now. It's a very fair question. Two, re, two things. Focus on the things we can control. It's a great idea to hypothesise and it's a great place to spend time in the pub arguing about all the things that might be. The only ones I know I can do anything about are the things I can control. 
And they've actually, this massive increase in productivity has actually enabled us to actually keep farming sheep. Like that's actually the key thing. Whether we want to or not is a different issue, but I, don't, I do believe that there's actually, that sheep have a future. And it's like Mike, I'm incredibly optimistic about farming future. Just we have to think about it differently and one of the things we need to think about is, is, is about different business models. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Is this even sensible? It sounds really daunting to me but I think it, it in fact it sounded ridiculous when I first started to think about this a couple of years ago but then we, I started to, we started to sit down and think about how we would do it and it's actually not nearly as bad as it seems. It's actually quite practical. If you look at lambs tailed per mixed age ewe mated, fundamentally we're getting about 6% of our lambs now come from hoggets. That's about 20-25% of lambs uh, reared or lambs weaned per, um, of the hoggets that we've got available. If you look at lambs tailed by adult ewes, only up by 7%, which is not massive actually. And we're going to get a lot of that through increase in ewe weight, just a slight increase in ewe weight. And we can pick it up as well with more use to terminals. So the big thing here is how we can get better lambings out of hoggets and make hoggets much more practical uh, in a big, on a scale. Lamb carcass weight going up by four kilos. That's, that's, a, big, that's a big call. Um, it's feasible in terms of genetics of the animal and it's feasible by putting more use to terminal sires and, with all, and slaughtering all the progeny. The disappearance rate uh, better ewe management to get that down. And a very slight increase in uh, ewe carcass weight. And that's actually all entirely feasible with, uh, at an industry level through greater uptake of improved genetics and the ongoing improvement in management. So even though it sounds incredibly daunting, it's actually all sensible and feasible. However, that's, but what can we do now? What can we do today, go home today and think about what we can do immediately? And we've got a way of looking at um, new technologies within Abacus which is really around asking the question is if you're going to make a difference on farm, what, the, what would a technology you're going to adopt look like? And basically there needs to be a really, really clear value proposition for a technology such that you can be, it's going to be profitable when you apply it in your farming system. That's a very fundamental way of looking at it. So we start looking at it. This is a very simple diagram. It's taken a lot of work to get to it, but it's a very simple diagram. And if you're going to look at a technology and you're going to say, what would it look like if it's going to be any damn good on a property? And I like the idea of these flaming, um, the aerial mowers and, and the weevils um, because they are things that are really simple to understand. They're very simple to implement if you happen to have a, something to spread them around or you hope they're going to do it themselves. They're really good technologies. They're simple to under, a technology that's simple to understand, it must be simple to understand. It must be incredibly, for anybody to understand, understand how it can make a difference. It must be unbelievably simple to implement. And if it gets there by itself, it's really simple. It must be profitable. It's obvious. And then in a system sense, readily scalable, that it means that if you did it with, say, 200 ewes, you know that in a, uh, over the next season you can go to 1,000, the next season you can go to, to 5,000. It's got to be really scalable, readily scalable. It's a very good test of a technology. And readily transferable, means that it's got, to be, it's got to be so obvious it can be taken up by other people. And when I was a, uh, when I was a, back when I was a student, it was after I was a kid, when I was a student, uh, we watched all grass wintering spread through Southland. And fundamentally, when I grew up as a kid, it was always shifting bloody swede brakes, and I vividly remember those damn rolls of cyclone with those wooden things. It taught me a lot about how, why, I, why I hated swede brakes. And it was always mud up to your bloody eyes as well. <laughs> so I can tell you, all grass winting was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> a few bales of hay spread out. Um, and um, so they are really, and that was really what really made all grass wintering work 
And it's a great example because it was still 40 odd years ago, more than that, nearly 50 years ago now actually. It was really simple to understand and it was really easy to see what the difference was and it was readily transferable because you could see what your neighbour did. But it worked. And there's a whole lot of other examples like that that are really powerful. So, where are some of the opportunities for now? Now one of the things really, really is, these are the four key things to me. Know where you're making your money. Know what's costing your money. How do you capitalise on higher learning percentages? percentages and then look at some, make, some management options and the last thing, make a plan. So know where you're making your money. What's driving your income? Well fundamentally in virtually all sheep operations it's the weight of lamb sold. In a beef operation it's actually the weight of beef sold but particularly it's not, not keeping them for, another, for a second winter. It's the biggest driver of profit. Because they don't do any damn good in the second winter. Right, what's costing us money? Well, dead ewes are costing us money. Knowing when they die is a really important thing. When, again, when I was a kid, we used to, use our, used to lose our ewes in the beginning of winter. Now, most of the time when you lose your sheep is near lambing. It's a very different pattern because you're keeping them for much longer before they die. So knowing when they die is actually quite helpful because it actually tells you something about how you might be able to manage them. What have we forgotten about? One of the things we have forgotten about, I think, sometimes is iodine and perhaps less so selenium. We're seeing um, some properties now where putting iodine back into the use is making a big difference to, um, to uh, uh, weaning percentages. Where it's coming from, we don't know, but we know the, the impact is there. Missing use. How many are disappearing and when are they missing? When are, when are they going missing? It's a really useful thing to know. So, what are some of the opportunities now by capitalising on a better lambing percentage? More use to terminals. At 140% weaning, you've got plenty of replacements with half your use going, going to breed replacements and half going to terminals. So that's a good benchmark to keep in your mind. At 140, if you're getting 140% weaning, you can afford to put half your use to terminals and meet, and meet all the lambs, meet all the progeny. Using Silace to find the breeders. Not all terminals are created equal. Some are not at all equal. Some are actually pretty bad. So effectively looking at who produces good terminals is a really, really good thing to do. So Silace is a fantastic tool to go there and look at who the breeders are who are doing well. Mating ewes at different times. You know, very, very practical, easy thing to do. Putting all your one-year ewes making them early, making them a month earlier, and then those that are that then using scanning data with those, those that have got singles, maybe feed them up a bit better, get them going off a bit earlier. A whole lot of tricks like that that make a big difference to infect your management, and then using scanning data for management. A lot of people are doing that. It's actually you've got to think of cunning ways to actually make it work for you. Because there's, there's a lot of different things for different systems that work differently and better there. So there's some sort of... Um, aspects. Now you look at some options for management. You know, this year we've been reminded about deep-rooted plants. And I've got a friend in the North Island who's, who's, been, who's been, for a, quite a while now, has been feeding a lot of willows to his beef cows. A lot of willows. They've gone, they've effectively, that's been a store of, of feed for them. Trees, shrubs, lucerne, deep-rooted plants. I'm doing some work, I'm working with a couple of groups in Australia at the moment looking at uh, different, uh, different shrubs that they can use in intercropping systems uh, uh, within pastures, looking at shrubs and different very deep rooted shrubs and other deep uh, sh uh, shrubs that might have particular nutrients in them that might be really good for animals, for sheep particularly. These sort of things are really, have got a, a lot of opportunities. The other thing is they provide you an opportunity to do two-tier farming. So you've got your grass on the top and you've got a few trees up the top, up, up higher. It's a very practical way of thinking about it. Soil moisture and temperature recording. One of our clients um, uh, in a previous uh, drought, or a previous just not even a drought, just a dry period, found that the, with their cattle, that gave them a three-week early warning system 
about what they had to do to destock, to, re to reduce their stocking rate, to move things around, because they could see what the soil temperature and what the soil moisture was doing gave them a very, very early warning. And later you're going to hear Paul Higgins talk about some of the future technologies that might make that a lot more, even more practical in the future. But that sort of thing provides a really early warning system uh, for uh, pasture, for potential, the impact it's going to have on pasture growth. Right, make a plan, write it down, plan it, think about it, discuss it, do it. But it's no damn good writing it in a book or not writing it down and then forgetting about it. There's a lot of lost data that's, that's either never written in a book or never even gets out of the book. It's actually do it, measure it, and then review it. Put it into things like, um, what does it mean? What does my scanning percentage actually mean? Do I count triplets? Do I not count triplets? Do I get the, do I get the scanner to count triplets? What does it mean? What's the difference between my two tooth and my older ewes? What are my t what's the weight of my two tooths going into mating? These sort of very simple things that enable you to do comparisons across years. Those sort of, re and re review it and see what works and what doesn't work or what might work. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about future, what I see as some trends and opportunities. Now, to me, thinking about the future is very useful, very helpful. We can't predict it, but we can think about the, what, what, might be, what might be some of the possibilities, what might happen, and we, it just helps you to think about what you might do to, uh, to actually go forward. And what can we do that's practical and achievable? Remembering that we're talking about things here that we can control. Very difficult to control the future. But we can do some things that, that might, be, might make it easier to manage. What we're going to talk about? Seven things I've written down here. Volatility in climates and markets. I'll go through each of these in a minute. Customers will get closer to our business. Client, compliance will become more important and it'll cost us money. We've heard about that from Mike earlier today. The structure of farming businesses, a bit about different ways of looking at the business, and how we involve the next generation. What we talk about, what's going on internationally in food security, water, and the, fa and the last one, technology, no matter what happens, technology will surprise us. Okay. Volatility. Volatility is just there. Volatility in climate, volatility in markets, we can't plan for the black swans. For those of you who know what a black swan event, it's the event that never ever happens. There were no black swans in the world until someone found them in Western Australia. Everyone knew that swans were white. Black swans are things that come out of nowhere. I've got some examples here. PSA in kiwi fruit is a really classical black swan event. No one expected it. In hindsight, you can say, well, you know, all those sort of things. The European, the prolonged nature of the European financial crisis can actually be seen as a black swan. The very much longer drought, in, uh, for some of us in living memory, might be a black swan. For other people, they'll say, I remember we had one of them in 1957. But for, we forget about how, often, about how much they can impact. But we can prepare ourselves to deal, deal with them. We can't plan for them, but we can prepare ourselves to deal with them. We can build a bit of flexibility into our systems. Customers are going to get closer to our business. That's just the reality of life. Farm, like the customers watching us, is a very good thing to think about. And they are watching us. When I was in, I'm doing a bit of work in Australia at the moment, and about a month ago I was in Australia, and there's a, a thing in the farmers, uh, one of the land or one of the farming journals there, about, uh, about um, one of the animal rights groups using drones to monitor feedlots. Okay? Think about what that means. And your immediate reaction, well, maybe I'll shoot the drone down. Not very practical. Where there's one drone, there's always another drone. Remember that. I have bees for fun. Compliance will be more important and it'll cost us money. So how do we turn compliance costs into a profitable opportunity? One of the things that, that you've heard Mike talk about was looking at lucerne. Can we make, effectively reduce the nitrogen going into the lake 
by effectively using a deep-rooted species? Really, really good question. We've got EID tags. How do we make EID tags a source of profit, not a source of cost? We've been working with a property, uh, one of the a property on that particular uh, angle. How can you turn it into a practical system that makes you money instead of costing you money? These are questions for the, these are questions for now that are going to have a big impact on the future. The structure of farming businesses. How can we separate land and business operations? How can we separate them? How can we make land as a secure but low yielding asset? One of our clients has recently sold a fairly large, uh, uh, fairly large part of the property to uh, someone who wanted an asset and was quite happy to take a relatively low yield on that asset but actually own the asset effectively and say, so the client has now got that back, leasing it back to, as a sheep operation, knowing long-term lease, long-term return on investment for the owner, long-term uh, for the client, so effectively it enables them to actually manage that and effectively it releases capital for other things. It releases capital, for example, to either repay debt or to invest in other, other aspects of the business. So that, that's another aspect about looking at the business in other ways. How do we involve the next generation? Absolutely crucial. It's one of the things that with an abacus we're thinking a lot about and we're working out how we bring our young people within the, in the business into the business. How do we make it so that this becomes a really big opportunity for them? A big opportunity for them to have this passion about agriculture. Maybe we do it through food. So many people love food. So how can we how can we turn food into can we turn food into into agriculture? As Mike Barton said, the final act of agri the final agricultural act is to eat it. If we think about it in that way, how can we how can we in fact get people to get passionate about agriculture? There's far too many flaming lawyers. I might have bred them, but I still don't, I'd rather train some others that aren't them, if you know what I mean. As far as I can see, lawyers cost the country money because they've got to find useful things to do. Well, what about future trends? So food security, protein demand and water are all, all real things. We do a lot of work in Asia. One of the things that's dominating, the reason we're getting work in Asia is food security. Food security is a massive issue for countries in Asia. They're really worried about where their staple foods are coming from. For example, Thailand is a major source of rice through, uh, through uh, parts of Asia. Thailand has security issues, then Thailand says we'll reduce rice exports. That's a really big worry for a lot of countries that depend on importing rice. Water is a bigger and bigger and bigger issue. Secure supplies of food at a reasonable price are an international issue. They are a threat to, to, threat to stability. They are a threat to us. They are a big, big issue. And the last thing is, there's nothing sure that technology is going to surprise us. We don't know where the opportunities are going to come from, but one of the most important things is, how do we reduce the time from innovation to uptake? How do we, in fact, make it much faster? How do we get these ideas out there and being actually used on farm in a practical way? So, today we've given you some thoughts about uh, on-farm productivity. The, the fantastic thing that sheep that we've done as sheep farmers, as sheep and beef farmers, actually, in the last uh, 25 years. What can we do now to improve profitability, and what can we do thinking about the future? And what can we say about what's next? Actually, not a lot. The one thing we can say, it can be sure of, is that the future will be both surprising and challenging. Great time to hand over to Paul. OK. Well, thank you, Peter. I think, actually, at the end there, you've asked a lot of very good questions yourself. But <laughs> <laughs> has anyone else got some questions for Peter? I'd like to ask um, them.
I had trouble hearing. Or a comment. I can't hear. Yeah. <laughs> Farm sick. I mean, I think that, that, that I think we have to think about farming in a different way, really, to be honest, about business models. And, um, and, and I think actually the Maori and kind of the Maori and corporations are doing some really interesting thing in looking at the transgenerational, and we're working with a couple of them, looking at transgenerational things and saying, okay, who owns this, big, who owns this asset? And that's one, that's one model, the big um, Maori and corporation, the big family, the big corporation type model. There are other models looking at um, people who would like to have an asset like that. I mean, bank yields don't look like they're going to move very far for a very long time. So can we in fact look at ways of restructuring farming businesses that effectively enable people to come in there, own an asset, and then let someone else farm for cash flow? That's the sort of thing that I think that we have to, they're the sort of models we've got to, and people have tried that, I know, in the past, but effectively I think we have to think about new models of doing things. Thank you. Look, I think, sorry, you've had enough of the statement to make. Uh, we sorry. need to keep the uh, question time for questions.